Everything is welcomed. So, uh, so uh, I would like to also thank uh, Tibet Policy Institute for making this possible. So, uh, in this session, I would like to talk about the pastoral nomads of Tibet. I don't see this at all. So uh, as Sarin Hindrubla, my colleague, has already uh, explained about how uh, the geological evolution, evolution of the Tibetan Plateau. So I will not take much time in this. But uh, as this morning, uh, we have a uh, respected Kalun Tipa talking about the jet streams. <coughs> so since most of you are young scholars here, I would almost like to share a brief information about the Tibetan Plateau and uh, how it is important mm -hmm. in terms of See, uh, as we have, say, uh, this morning, uh, our current table was talking about the jet stream. So this is, I would like to spend maybe one minute on this. See, we have, since at the age of global warming and climate change, as the Tibetan plateau heats up, you can see the whole plateau is elevated at approximately 4,500 meters above the sea level. So when the plateau heats up, it creates a heat pump. A vacuum is created here. So in this case, as the heat flows in, so it more like attracts the breeds with moisture-laden breeds, millions of tons of breeds, water vapors are trapped or attracted from the Bay of Bengal. So this is in turn, some of the meteorologists have said that Tibetan Plateau also triggers the South Asian summer monsoon, or it's also regarded as the rainmaker for Asia. So along with this, along with this jet stream, the moisture, it also carries lot of soot particles, the dust particles from the Southeast Asian countries, and they get in time deposited on these glaciers, so which also enhances or which also increases the rate of the glacial retreat by absorbing the heat. So I'll not go further into this. Uh, my next slide, uh, since I was uh, given or I chose the topic of nomads because this a nomad issue is one of the most important thing. and. Uh, since we have been writing about our desk, we have been writing reports about nomads issue, the pastoral nomads issue, long time back since 2006, 2007. But as such, on an international and regional issue or platform, this nomads issue hasn't gained much momentum over the past few years. So due to a good support from the Tibet support group and the international community, these NGOs, these days we are trying and we are able to get good highlights on the issues of the nomads especially the Tibetan nomads. So as I used to tell my friends and other media people that Tibetan nomads are unlike the nomads that you will see in some Indonesia or Papua New Guinea or in African countries, Tibetan nomads are considered as the pastoral nomads. Pastoral nomads means Tibetan nomads are not like hunter and gatherers. They used to live, uh, they used to travel with their livestock, sheep and yaks. So in a way, we have on this plateau, the whole plateau, we have a vast range of grasslands. And they are saying approximately 70% to 60% of the whole plateau at a prime should be or considered as the, we are seeing alpine pastures or the grasslands. So these alpine pastures play a very important role. Not only the health of these glaciers, uh, sorry, the health of these, the grasslands. These uh, recent scientific findings have found that these grasslands in turn, they protect Tibet to be the water tower of Asia because these grasslands, when they get degraded, so it will have a domino effect for the underground soil, which is a frozen permafrost soil. So when these grasslands are degraded, they will in turn affect the property of the soil, the frozen soil, to hold water for a long time. So these permafrost soils, along with so this, uh, I would like to jump to this slide quickly. And here, this is shows, in fact, this map was taken from Dan Miller's. 
So this shows we have the area coverage of the pastoral nomadic life before 1950. We have the nomadic life, I will go through a series of pictures. So since the nomadic community 1950s, we have a lot of changes happened since the commune system. And uh, I will not go detail into how important or what the daily chows and the role of woman, the role of a father as a herder, the role of a mother. So these pictures will tell out automatically the plight at which these nomads used to live on these vast land pastures before 1950. Since uh, we have these nomads, they consider these days the animals as their wealth. And they don't have any, we have insurance, like we used to have for fixed deposits in banks. So these nomads, they depend everything, their entire life, the generation saving on these animals. So actually they have their wealth on these hoofs. So now these days with the new policies coming up, the issue of and the recent scientists, they are also talking about how sustainable the nomadic way life was. In fact, some scientists have even mentioned, uh, scientists or the anthropologists have also said that the nomadic way of life is actually is an adaptation to live successfully on the Tafan Plateau. If you want to live on the Tafan Plateau successfully, you have to be like a nomad. So this Sustainability is one key issue why the nomads are so successful for over 8,000 years on this Tibetan plateau. At times, the temperature can drop to very extreme temperatures. And another thing is about the mobility. The nomads, they used to move from, say, summer pasture to autumn pasture, spring pasture, and then we have this whole cycle for three months or more than two and a half months cycle. So this mobility actually in itself is a great contribution for the health of these grasslands because this mobility at some point it also encourages or it also helps to maintain these grasslands in a very healthy condition. Now with the advent of new policies and especially I have here see for example this we have we can say this is a summer pasture high up in the mountain, or a spring pasture. And such pictures tells us the challenge, the conditions that we have. OK, so this will tell it in a brief how the nomads have faced hardship over the times. So this all happened since the collectivization due to the commune system. Everything was collectivized. Whatever the nomads they owned, everything was collectivized. And the nomads were given work points. Some nomads were forced to work as a farmer. So these all happened between 1960s and late 70s. And with the death of Mao Zedong, and similarly, we have the new, the decollectivized system or the private privatization system. So in this privatization system, the nomads, they were able to regain some control of their herds. And if you look, or if you happen to notice the statistical yearbook in China, you'll notice that during this period, during the late 1970s and 80s, the population of sheep, the population of yak, have increased a lot. So this all because the PLA, they only have one target. They want a non-floor stop of meat for the armies. So they have more like literally created a whole bunch of uh, animal husbandries. So this animal husbandry, in a way, have now, the scientists have realized that this is the starting point of the grassland degradation on the Tibetan Plateau. It started from late 1970s. The grassland degradation has in fact started from late 1970s. And then when the privatization policy starts or the decollectivization after the death of Mao during 1980s and late 90s, the Nomads they regain some control of their herds. So this is when you realize that the population of sheep and the population of yak have reduced to a very manageable level. But at this point also, the nomads, they don't have the control of the land. And then they have started series of policies. We have fencing policies, uh, mountain closures. 
So we have two main departments or the agencies, Chinese officials, putting pressure on these Namas. The first is the animal husbandry, and the second is the forest department bureau. The forest department bureau, they have, in fact, made their own laws, the mountain closures. And the animal husbandry bureau, they have have the fencing lands, the fencing of the grasslands, the fencing policies, and the grassland law actually started, the initial grassland law actually started in 1985s. <coughs> then we have, in the late 90s to 2000, the land lease certificate was issued to the nomads. So this gave some relief to the nomads because now they own a piece of land and the land lease, the whole land was contracted for 30 to 50 years depending on the sales of the herds or depending on the size of the herds and the location. Since 2003, there has been a huge change. These contracts has been canceled, even though it is approved by the central state. Now these contracts has been canceled, and now we have the nomads are removed. We are not mentioning, we are not using the word resettled, because there has been least communication discussion between the nomadic tribe or the nomadic clan and the officers concerned. They are being forcefully removed to new concrete blocks. So this ha all happened since 2003 onwards when they started the new grassland policy. Actually, it is the restore grassland policy. Or in, in Chinese, they are saying uh, the Tumui Hum Chao. Or in Tibetan, they are saying Chukyur Zakyong. That means you have to disown all your herds in order to restore, or in order to restore for the grasslands. So this is the actually the land lease certificate that was issued to all the nomads and some of the farmers saying, so in this, certificate in this uh, sort of, we have seen that each families were allocated the number of ships and each family has to come out with a certain amount, the weight of wool, meat. So they cannot also exceed the production. And they also have to sell, sell it specially to a consigned government agency. They cannot, ha they cannot sell it in the market. So these land lease certificate, they have on now this land lease certificate and the ownership, everything has been canceled. Now the nomads are being removed to the concrete blocks. And there is another scientific school of thoughts. They are saying, but the Chinese, they are also referring it, but they are not telling it loudly in the media. They're saying that the nomads removal actually started from this area. In Tibetan, we call it Matizasum. Uh, <coughs> where the head regions of Machu, Dichu, and Zachu. So the nomads were first removed from these head regions. Since uh, the scientific community, or Matula has mentioned now, these days the Chinese, they move really strong on the scientific backgrounds. So some of the Chinese scientists, they have said that the health of these rivers, these yellow rivers, especially Yangtze River, yellow and Yangtze River, they depends on the health of the grasslands on these plateaus. So these grasslands, in order to have these grasslands in a good condition, now they are blaming the nomads that your herds has overgrazed these grasslands. And they are not telling directly. Actually, they want to secure the water tower, the Chinese water tower. So in a way, at some points, the Chinese, they officially, they are openly saying that this nomad is totally backward culture. And some social scientists, now they are realizing what the nomadic culture has actually contributed because they have been able to live successfully for over 8,000 years on these plateaus. The mobility of the life, the mobility life, the sustainability, and the simplicity has so far helped them to live successfully on this plateau. <coughs> now, as uh, Matthew has also mentioned, now these pastures are open to any extractive industries and future constructions. <coughs> and actually, the nomad's removal has started in, say, I have mentioned here 31 counties in six prefectures. These all started in the Ambu area, Qinghai region. But now they have moved inside the TAR, in <coughs> Yushu area and Nakchu area. They are starting to remove the nomads. The scale at which these nomads are removed, are some are saying approximately 1.43 nomads are already removed or forcefully settled. And this shows actually the rate at which uh, the Yellow River is drying, and the reason behind why the nomads are removed, because this shows, this is a part of a tributary in China where the Yellow River has totally dried up. So in order to have a continuous flow, the Yellow River, 
they are trying to protect the head regions of this Yellow River. So in a way, they're trying to remove the nomads and to give them a very uh, interesting, as Gabriela was also mentioning, about the Chinese, they love to call the nomads as an ecological migrant, as if they have voluntarily agreed to move. So these are some of the pictures <coughs> showing about the fencing policy. So the problem with the fencing policy is it also restricts the mobility life of the nomads. And at some point, it also uh, comes in the way of the migrating herds. For example, this is in Damshung area. You can see, you can actually compare these two sides. Like this whole area has been protected for winter grazing. And this has been allowed. So they also arise uh, the thought of the tragedy of commons. This is uh, one of the Chinese they would like to say, if everything is for commons, so who will benefit? And another thing is, if you look carefully here, the some scientific studies have conducted, and they found that actually if you fence a grassland, you will have more biomass. Biomass is there automatically, but they will not have any chance to regrow. And some have even conducted experiments saying that uh, the soil, a very important factor is carbon to nitrogen ratio. Those soils which are being grazed, they show a higher concentration of carbon to nitrogen ratio. And automatically, I have met some soil scientists <coughs> also. They are saying that the hoof, the hoof of the animal, actually, it plays a very important role in uh, pumping in the oxygen and aerating the soils while grazing. And also, the dunk, the whole nitrogen cycle takes place. So they are actually referring, why not the savannas grasslands are not degrading at this rate? And why? it's considered as the dependent plateau if overgrazed. So this question is, the first thing I've mentioned about the overgrazing actually started. So this is very important thing that you should know. The, the overgrazing actually started in late 1970s during the commune system. And after the commune system, they have started the fencing policy. And actually, we have more localized overgrazing started in the fence. So I will quickly go into these slides. These slides show how the migrating herds, they are being affected by the fencing policy. And these are the government, at some point they are saying, at these points, the nomads, as written here, they have approximately 1.43 nomads, million nomads are being moved. And they are saying by the year 2013, they are planning to remove the entire nomadic community. And I have here some pictures showing about the nomadic settlement. This is, in fact, in Kormo. And some of these pictures we received, these we received in 2009. And the most pressing issue problem in these, the new settlements or the concrete settlement is, the first thing is the lack of clear or clean drinking water. This is one thing, and the lack of sanitation. So the Chinese government, they are saying at some point, these nomads, they need to be trained. They need to be put in an urban setting so that they can learn something. And they are saying that these nomads have moved voluntarily in a way to gain access to more modern techniques or more modern gadgets, schoolings, etc. But we have come across and we have interviewed some new arrivals from Tibet, especially from Nuri region and especially from the Chamdo area, and they are saying that these nomadic areas, most of these areas, they, are, they lack the basic sanitation and the problem with the unemployment. As you have seen that these, most of these settlements are constructed near the roadside. There are some youngsters we have. And the very pressing issue is about, especially about the younger generations. Some of these, the infants, they end up as waste scavengers because they keep on collecting the waste scraps and it's become more like a tourist spot. And the younger generations, they waste their time. At some point, they are saying that they are also pushed, in, indirectly pushed into alcoholism because they are not trained to do any urban jobs. And what we are saying is that if 
the nomads are given the choice whether they want to move voluntarily, then we are not against this nomad resettlement. But there should be a transition phase in between. The nomads should be at least trained, maybe five to month, five months or six months, so that after this transition period or the training period, they will be able to work <coughs> themselves in urban settings. But there is nothing there. Actually, this is a displacement from point A to point B. And whenever they try to raise any petitions and uh, grievances, nothing <coughs> happens. See, so I would like to uh, share a small case study of the Mokru clan, the nomadic clan of in Solo area. So there is a very interesting documentary shown. And the infants here, from the morning, actually, they are not attending school. They are wearing the nomadic costumes because if they pose a photograph with a tourist here, they will get one Chinese yuan. So this has become more like a tourist show for the nomads. So this is in Mogru clan. And they are given uh, petitions to clear, especially this is in the Tsongo area, where I have seen it here. This is in the Tsongo area. And this lake is also considered very heavy, very, say, holy by this nomadic clan. And the problem is all these nomadic clans are removed from the holy lake. And a whole huge barricade has been constructed here, which at some point, which discourages these nomads to practice their ritual holy writings. And another case is uh, in Kam Setar. We recently we received this picture, and according to the pictures, uh, I think this has happened in mid or late 2010. And here we have seen a whole, these are actually a pastoral area, a nomadic community. We can, we can see the herds of yaks grazing here, and here we are actually having a mining activities going on here. So if the new nomads resettlement policy, as the Chinese they are left to say, is actually is to conserve or to restore these grasslands. And these pictures tell totally a different story. So this shows how the policies or the, what the laws they are saying are very flexible. And at some point, these laws can be bended for your own benefit. Like we have, and I've checked, this is actually a gold mining facility in Kamsetar. These all are pictures from that nomadic pastoral area. And one thing I hope most of you have seen, uh, this Mr. Scotter, Professor Scotter has actually, he's been invited to China to even write rapporteur the food. And what he has noticed, and uh, he has made in a special statement that the herders, or I think in this case he's referring to the nomads and the semi-nomadic families, they should not be, uh, should not, as a result of measures adopted under the Tumai Hum Chau policy is the restore grassland policy, which was a new grassland law or renovation of the grassland law is uh, actually enacted in 2003. So he has made another appeal or the latest in 20th January 2012. And we don't know and we so far we are trying to get the real uh, data because what he has mentioned very specifically is from till 20th January he has mentioned that we have uh, 18 of those self emulators in Tibet. 18 of those self-emulators in Tibet are from the nomadic community. This is what he has mentioned. So we are in the process of identifying, actually going to the roots of it. We are actually saying, he is saying, since the nomadic communities, they have been deprived of all the basic needs, and they, they can't go back to the pastures, they cannot practice their own life. So from all the angles, these nomadic communities, they are facing a huge problem. Um, I think that would be end. And uh, in fact, I would like to request the chairperson to give me five more minutes. I would like to explain something on the mineral extraction, as Matthew Lai has mentioned. And uh, for your information, uh, I have heard, overheard, Ambassador Lalipla asking about the rare earth elements in Tibet. And yes, we have reserves of rare earth elements in Tibet, and especially in the Tsongun area the Qinghai area, the Kokonor, the Southern Basin, they have been exploiting rare earth elements, but not to a very profitable level. And uh, some recent research in 2010, a Chinese scientists have actually, uh, we have invited Professor Kang, right? Actually, he has written a paper on the rare earth elements 
that is very abundant in the Namto Basin. Namto Basin actually is in TAR. And he has mentioned that the rare earth elements, the concentration of the rare earth elements in Namto Basin is much higher than what they have found or what they've been extracting from the Tongue area. So far, no extractive industries has been there positioned in the Namto Basin. But we believe that due to the infrastructures they have made, I think they will spend no time in exploiting those reserves. And another thing is about uh, the lithium extraction. And they have found a new reserve of lithium, which is more like, uh, it is now the mineral of the century, lithium and rare earth elements, being its very important use in sophisticated missile, ballistic missiles, and uh, all those electronic gadgets. So I think since the Chinese, they have owned more like 90% of this market, the lithium markets are being controlled by China, and I think they will surely play a huge role in, you know, like they have played for Japan. They have made it very hard for Japan by stopping uh, the export of rare earth elements, or sorry, the lithium to Japan. I think the same will the China will play. So as long as I think it's very important that from a strategic point of view, the government has to develop. So if you want to develop, but you, you cannot incline or rely too much on the Chinese because at some point, when they have the power to monopolize something, then they will really play the cards. So this is something that I would like to talk very confidently because I know it from the past experience that China has been very good. First, they will try to you know put all those saying that, okay, Tibet, we have a rich mineral reserve on one side. On one side, the, others, the, uh, the foreign investors, they are looking for a very flexible environmental you know, they can always go through these loops. So once they have acquired everything, then same thing happened with the Shihitongwe mining also earlier. The Canadian mining company have invested a lot. Now everything is owned by a Chinese company. So I think once they have the control of the whole earth, reserve earth, I think they will play a huge role. Thank you. <laughs>